Hello, everybody. Today is Thursday, August 11, 2016, and this is the week in charts. So what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, as usual, anything you want to talk about, and your favorite stock picks. Hold off on your stock picks, if you don't mind, until we get to the charts. I'm going to lecture for a few minutes here, as I usually do. And today, we're going to talk about micromanagement. This is something that I see quite often and this was one of those weeks it seems like lately it's been like that i'm kind of saying the same thing over and over again and i'm like what are we going to talk about and then you guys always um you know i always give me a topic seems like so that's uh, pretty awesome but based on some recent interactions it's probably one of the biggest sins that i see when it comes to trading this week's show is brought to you by me once again check out my trading service you can start it for just $47. You get to see the first month of what's going on. If you want to go longer term, let me know. Maybe I'll work a, a good deal for you on that. I do uh, discount the longer term subscriptions tremendously because most people I find aren't willing to stick around long enough to reap the fruits of their labor. They're off to trade some other methodology if things get crappy um, or if no trends come along quickly. And as soon as they do, what happens? They end up perpetually out of phase. A big trend comes along shortly the day after as murphy would have it anyway um i've talked enough about it in the past let's just move on here uh there's a disclaimer screen as you know you can lose money trading or as I often sum it up stealing a line from my friend greg morris all predictions about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then so how do we define micromanagement or how does marion webster Merriam webster Define micromanagement. And I think this is a pretty good definition. To try to control or manage all the small parts of something, such an activity, in a way that is usually not wanted or that causes problems. Taking one step further, micromanagement and trading is trying to outsmart the market by abandoning a simple trading plan due to some sort of logic or feelings. And logic or feelings we'll get into quite a bit in a minute. And it's also a propensity to take action when none is needed. Confusing the issue with facts, that's a big problem that I often see, and allowing the market to teach you badly. Let's explore those further. Let's talk about confusing the issue with facts. I actually bought the domains. Do not confuse the issues. <laughs> do not confuse the issue with facts.com. And uh, don't, D O N T, confuse the issue with facts.com. These are just some of the emails that I receive. The market is in, the market ended higher, but the stock is just sitting there. And in one case, the market ended lower, and the stock is just sitting there. It was a short. And somebody bailed out on it, and the next day the short imploded about 50%, which, as you know, if you're short, that's a good thing. I think it's gone against, I think it's gone far enough against me. And I'm going to flesh that out in just a second. But you're in a stock, it starts going against you a little bit, so you bail out long before your stop has ever hit. On the flip side, a lot of times I see people, well, they got a small profit, so they better lock it in, and we'll flesh that out too. Every now and then they really confuse the issue with facts by saying that the fundamentals really aren't that good. And this one was just yesterday. The volume has dried up. There's no more interest. And I was hoping that the stock would take off in early morning trading, so it would make a great example. And the stock is headed sideways. It's dead money. You've seen me do tons and tons of dead money reports here. So let's explore how the market teaches you to micromanage. And as I often say, the market could be a really bad teacher when it comes to trading. So let's take a look at some examples of bad teaching. There's there's a plethora of them. 
But let's say you got a pullback. We have a pullback. And you decide, okay, I'm going to enter here. And if I get triggered in, I'm going to put a stop in there. So you get triggered in, and then the market begins to implode. And you're bummed out. And then you watch the market continue to implode and stop you out. You see another setup. Looks pretty good. Got your little plan in place. Got your entry. Triggers an entry. Stock begins to come back in. You get kind of, you get kind of bummed out. And then you get stopped out. And then you get really bummed out. Now, this might happen quite a few times. So on the next trade, you start following the plan, but then when it begins to go against you, you begin to think, oh, F this, here we go again. So what do you do? You just bail out. And initially you feel pretty good. Not that you feel good about a loss or losing trade, but you feel good that you didn't lose as much as you thought you would because based on these two prior experiences, or as I tried to imply here, based on these multiple experiences, you realize that, hey, I don't want to lose any more money. I must, I must stop the bleeding. So you bail out. So what happens next? Of course, the market takes off without you. Now, let's look at another situation. Let's say you're following your plan, and then you have a little small profit in the trade. Not a huge profit, maybe not even anywhere near the initial profit target, but you have a profit, and then the stock implodes and stops you out. So you're bummed down on that. So you take another trade, and you have a profit, and again, it might not be quite to the initial profit target, but you have a small profit in the trade, and you're feeling pretty good about that. And then what happens next? The stock begins to implode and stops you out. So once again, add the rinse and repeat. That happens quite a few times. So you get to thinking, well, wait a minute. I think I just pull my mic out. Oh, there it is. So again, you get in the next trade. And again, you get to thinking, you know what? Give me my money. This looks pretty good. Got a little money in this trade. I got to pay for those prior losses. So I'm going to take that profit. And you know what? Stock begins to implode. You feel pretty damn good. And then what happens next? The stock takes off without you. Now that one trade would have paid for all of those prior losses and then some. So one thing I was thinking about this morning is why do we micromanage? Well, it all comes back to the fact that we're not really made to trade. The real world in the trading world are two completely different worlds. You became successful in your current or prior career by taking action. You control the situation to the best of your abilities. If you have employees, you don't just let them run around like chickens with their heads cut off, doing whatever they want, whenever they want. If you're building a bridge, you're using certain steel to certain spec. And I don't want to show how little I know about engineering. I know a little bit about tinkering, but not a whole lot about engineering. But I do know that if I'm going to build something, like I'm building something now, I know I need steel at least so thick. And I have to control, I have to learn how to weld so I can get my welds just right so the stuff doesn't fall apart. So you have to control the situation to the best of your abilities. If you're a doctor, you can't just let patients bleed out, obviously. And that list goes on and on and on. Logic is really crucial to life, but often a hindrance in the markets. The smarter you are, the harder it is. Now, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but I was talking with somebody. I said, hey, I know you're this. And they're like, no, don't insult me by saying I'm that. I'm really 
this. It's like, uh, okay, you know, it's like I, I know you're, uh, um, I know you're, whatever, very analytical. Well, I'm a Nobel Prize winning scientist, you know, not quite, but you get the idea. I know you're a scientist. No, I'm a rocket scientist. I know you're a surgeon. No, I'm a brain surgeon. It's like, okay, well, the smarter you are, the harder it's going to be because you're going to interject logic. The more successful you are, the harder it's going to be not to micromanage because you're going to want to control the situation. And we also have this innate urge to control pain. As I said a minute ago, you must stop the bleeding. You feel like, oh, I must stop the bleeding. I have a loss on a trade. I'm watching one right now. In fact, I'm going to follow my own advice, and I'm going to reach over and turn off my monitor. It's been bugging me for two days because I'm watching it, and I feel like i got to stop this pain. So I just turned off my monitor, which we'll get to in just one second. I've told the story a thousand times, and I'll tell it a thousand more I, I don't know how many times, I can't remember how many times I've been watching my screens closely and, and drop a few F-bombs and get pissed off and go walk around the block. And as I've said before, my block's roughly about two miles because I'm out in the middle of the country. Get a little fresh air, get a little sweaty and come back to my office and everything turned around. Now, not all the time. I mean, if it did, I'd be walking about 100 miles a day, <laughs> but not all the time, not every time, but quite often it amazes me how many times I allow myself to go through this unnecessary emotional round trip by watching every tick, by looking at every tick and letting that affect my mood. I told my wife, in fact, I even told my wife a few minutes ago not to to do anything with micromanaging but the pressure is always there and I said uh she said good luck with your show I said yeah uh, and we were talking a little bit as I was getting some water and I'm like I'm a little bummed out market's going against me and that just has me in a bad mood it's amazing everything else could be crappy and the market's going for me and I seem to be able to handle everything else very well but if it's just the opposite, if the market's going against me, even if other things are going well, it puts you in a bad mood. So you feel like you have to do something to stop the pain. What's causing this bad mood that I'm in, okay? Well, the market's going against me. Now, in a bigger scheme of things, what difference does it make, Okay. I knew someone who would always say, a hundred years from now, what difference will it make? Well, when he got fired, his boss says, when he got pissed off, his boss says, well, a hundred years from now, what difference will it make? Anyway, that's another story. But what difference will it make if you do follow your plan longer term? So you have to reduce the amount of emotional round trips that you're making. And that's often caused by watching your screen too much. So you must resist that urge to have that little voice in your head constantly tell you that you have to be doing something. And reality is, if you have a plan in place, there's not, there's not much to do, okay? But again, if you think about it from a human psychology standpoint, if you are successful in life, then what are you doing? You're taking action. You do. You, you have to do something. You have to see some patients or build some bridges or train some dogs. Otherwise, you're not going to get paid. So you have to take some action. But in trading, there's often nothing to do. And one thing that I often say, and I've been working with somebody on and off for many years, and they seem to struggle quite a bit, and I basically said, look, if and when it ever clicks with you, or no, nah, I didn't say when, but I said when it clicks, not if, but when it clicks with you, you're going to find that trading is quite boring, okay? Often there's nothing to do. So how do you resist that urge? Well, first of all, know that you do not know. No one knows where market is headed. I often say not, not you, not me. 
and not the guy behind a tree. I bet you thought I was going to say, not the guy who screams on TV, <laughs> as I often do. But you have to know that you don't know, okay? And you can't interject logic thinking, oh, well, the stock is down, the market is up, something's wrong, something's up, so I better bail. Another thing that helps quite a bit is accept the potential loss going in. It's just the cost of doing business, okay? I have to buy some supplies. I need some tablets. I need some pens. Probably going to need a computer soon at some point, okay? I don't – it doesn't excite me to do these things, but it doesn't bum me out that I have this cost of doing business. So – if you could look at a trade going in and say, well, I'm going to risk 2% of my account, and that's what it's going to cost me, okay? Now, of course, there's going to be a, there's going to be the potential that it could make a lot of money, but you can't get too excited about that. You can't focus on that too much. Sometimes you have to look at what your potential cost is. Almost, and I don't want to phrase it too negatively, but it's almost like you have to accept that loss going in. If you take a trade, it's going to cost you this. And in fact, maybe it's okay to think like that because that might make you trade a little bit less if you're over trading. It might make you think, as I'm going to beat the dead horse on in a few minutes, do I really have the best of the best setup before I go out and put that capital in the harm's way? Now, as I just alluded to, ironically, I just had to turn my screens off, okay? I know me, okay? I have to embrace me, and you have to embrace you. And sometimes the easiest thing to do is just push the little button on your monitor. Turn it off, okay? If you're trading my methodology, as I often say, good traders... Trading my methodology, or busy traders trading my methodology, or, or good traders, okay? Busy traders make for good traders because they're not trading in mediocre conditions. They're picking the best. They're leaving the rest. I know it's cliche. And they're not micromanaging their positions because they have a surgery ahead of them or they have a dog with an owner at their front porch knocking on the door saying, hey, train me and my dog. So turn your screens off if you have to. And two things are going to happen if you turn your screens off, okay? Number one, you're going to get stopped out at a loss. Well, it's almost a release with me when I get stopped out at a loss. As soon as I get stopped out at a loss, I am completely over it. Now, your psychology might be a little bit different, and you're going to have to embrace your own psychology. But as I just said a minute ago, I've got something going against me. I'm pissed off, okay? I'm in a bad mood because of that. So I turn my screen off. Now, as soon as I get stopped out, I'm, I have this release like, good riddance, see you later. Let's try to find something else that might be worthwhile. Good. I got a loser out the way. Time for some winners. So it is a bit of a release, at least for me, when, when it finally does stop out, if it is, is going to stop out. At other times, as I said, sometimes you're pleasantly surprised. Things begin to turn around, and you do okay. Now, one thing I would recommend you do, and I actually wrote a long article about this, is on the next trade, and only that trade, follow the plan. And as I often say, if you can't follow the plan on just your one next trade, then maybe you shouldn't be trading. Now, I've never really said that too much because I really think that anybody who wants to trade, who truly wants to trade, who truly wants to learn how to trade, can learn how to trade and trade. But in some cases, you really have to want it. And so I rarely say maybe you should trade, but 
if you can't follow the plan on the next trade that maybe you should should be trading or maybe you should be paper trading until you could get some reps in paper trading to where you follow the plan follow the plan follow the plan put some real money on the line if you don't follow the plan then go back to paper trading for a while until you get used to doing it to where it could be a little bit of both and, and I don't, for some reason i'm thinking of like a flight simulator i've never flown or anything when i was a kid i played with flight simulators a little bit um but I imagine if you spend a lot of time in a flight simulator, especially nowadays because they're very realistic, like a real one, like an air, what an airline might have, then when it comes time to actually fly the plane or you actually flying the plane, it's not necessarily the same thing. There's going to be some emotions and fear and other things involved, but you might be more likely to do things mechanically, okay? if you've got your reps in so just on your next trade that only only that one trade follow your plan and then once you do that then rinse and repeat for the next 10,000 trades all right keep the questions coming we're going to get to those in just one second uh good good things good questions coming in now as i often preach you know my wife often says hey what do you think about your, my call uh, you say a lot of the same shit over and over again well, but I keep saying that shit until everybody gets it, you know? And and I get tired of I get tired myself of, of of hearing me speak about these things. But as long as there's people out there that are making these mistakes over and over again, as long as I'm making some mistakes too, then I'm gonna keep preaching about these things. So we used to have a saying back in the computer days, garbage in, garbage out. Whatever you put in whatever you get out. That goes for computers, it goes for life, and it's one of the few things in trading that is like life. So if your stock picking is not that good, you're going to have problems. As I often say, I've had, it's 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 happened several times, I've been called. Uh, one time I think it was 19 times, one time, time I think it was 20 times, so I say it, uh, 21 times in a row. So somewhere around 19 to 20 something times in a row, People have been stopped out. I've had several calls throughout my career. Dave, I don't know what's going on. Stopped out, whatever, 20 times in a row. Okay, well, two things. One, your stops are probably too tight. That's that's a whole that's a whole nother conversation. And I've got two fairly recent YouTubes. I think back in April, if you go to videos of a website, I've got two complete uh, one hour plus we could charge just on setting stops. So that's the first thing. The second thing, the second problem is that your stock picking could probably use a little work. Okay. Is the stock really trending? Is it accelerating in a trend? Is it persisting? What's the net net move? Is it significantly higher than it was or is it about the same? And I know we have some newbies in here today, and I won't pick on you. But some of the people in here that should know better are probably going to ask today about some stocks. And I don't want to pick on them either, but at some point I'm going to have to start giving you some tough love and beating you up a little bit. Otherwise, you're not going to get it. But you're going to see people ask about stocks in a few minutes that have gone sideways for weeks and sometimes even months. And if you're in here, you're a trade trader. Otherwise, you're just – you just – you're just annoying everyone, right? That's why we're here. We're trade traders. Or if you're not a trade trader yet, maybe I can convince you to be a trade trader. And maybe that's a good reason. Maybe that's fodder for another um, lecture down the road. So how is your stock picking? Are you picking the best of the best? Are you really thinking hard before putting that capital in harm's way? Okay. Say you got a 100K account that you've allocated for trading. You're going to risk 2% on a trade. That's $2,000. Before you, quote, unquote, spend $2,000 on a trade, and we all know it could, could be even more if it blows through your stop, which could happen. And it, it, believe me, it happens. Been there, done that, got the T-shirt. I think we all have. But think about that cost going in. Before you put up that $2,000 and possibly more, 
do you really like the setup? Okay. Are conditions conducive for your methodology? Is it, as I said in Market Wizards, intuition or is it intuition? Okay. So trying to make something happen when nothing is there is a recipe for disaster. You'll often see in my trading service today, as a matter of fact, I'm going to give you my, I'm going to give you my trading plan for today. Don't take any new setups. Okay. Why am I paying you to tell me to do nothing? Well, you know what? I wish somebody 20 something years ago would have told me not to be like the little rat hitting the button trying to get the cocaine. Okay. Sometimes the best action is no action. Sometimes you have to wait. So pick the best and leave the rest. I know it's cliche, but I'm surprised at how many people don't do that. And at the least, at the least, if people put, put hard earned cash into harm's way and they almost lose it consistently because they're picking crappy stocks. So, and I'm going to soft sell here for a second. I think a course would pay for, pay for itself a hundred times over. But even if you don't take the course for free, go to my website, go into stock selection and watch the video I did on stock selection. It's about an hour long. People in marketing tell me, Dave, you should, you should have like a 10 minute teaser video. Well, I want to teach you something. I don't want you to make you think, Oh, I'm going to hide it all from you or whatever. I want to try to get you up to speed at least a little bit, but at the least watch that little one hour video, whatever's on that stock selection page. And get up to speed, and you're going to see a lot of those concepts we're going to talk about today when we get to the charts. So I know it's cliche, but pick the best, leave the rest, or conditions conducive. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist or a Nobel Prize winning rocket scientist to know that if a market is here six months ago and then it's here today, there's a good chance that it might not be a good time to be trend following, to be trading a trend following methodology. I'm not suggesting you switch methodologies. What I'm suggesting you do is sit on your hands a little bit. I don't want to back too much into reverse and mean trading, but quick story. Uh, yesterday or day before, I was working on this course, um, and I was talking a little bit about my intro course I've been talking about so much. Uh, it's, kind of, it's starting to consume me a little bit, but the – I was talking about reversion to the mean trading and explaining to you why you shouldn't trade reversion to the mean. And I Googled someone who I know of who's a who's a well-known, famous, somewhat famous, I guess, a reversion to the mean trader. And I was amazed, and I'm and I don't I'm not being shot in Friday, but I'm amazed that it looks like he kind of pushed that reversion to the mean stuff aside and now is a trend follower. So welcome to the club. Took you 20 something years, but I'm glad I'm glad you're here. So I don't want to get myself in trouble by throwing anybody under the bus. But anyway, I just find that kind of interesting. Now, one thing that and this comes right from the intro course that I'm working on. And this will probably be in the free section of the course. But regardless of your methodology, you must position yourself for limited losses and unlimited gains. Now, if you think about it, amongst other things, amongst other problems, micromanagement will more than likely prevent you from capturing, and maybe I should say from ever capturing, okay, a longer term gain from ever. Is that right English? I don't know. Is that right English? Good English? <laughs> um, I'm not, I don't claim to be an English uh, professor here. But you'll never capture, or more than likely never capture. You certainly won't capture enough longer term trends to make it worth your while. So again, you must position yourself for limited losses and limited gains. The reason I backed it to reversion to the bead trading, which I really didn't want to, but the reason I did is because reversion to the bead trading does just the opposite. It gives you limited gains and potentially unlimited losses, which is a recipe for disaster. Now, but Dave, I thought you said it's not my way or the highway. Well, it's not my way or the highway, 
but I do tend to see some problems out there, and I see them happen. And and trust me, I've been there, done that, and I got the T-shirt. Okay, Shay has a question here. One of the things I find very hard is making a decision with a stock just takes a few cents from the trigger or the stop. Okay. Well, let's talk about the trigger first. So say we have a little generic pullback. Let me start let's start over on that. So say we have a little generic pullback. And we're going to enter here. And it's going to be on entry. And what he's saying is he hates it when they come close to the trigger but don't quite get there. I kind of hate that too, especially the service because tomorrow we know that this stock is likely going to trigger on noise alone. So then that becomes a discretionary call. You have to make that go or no go decision. I don't want to get too far into that because there's not enough time for that today. But I hate that too. But the bottom line is you have to work hard to follow the original plan and let the chips fall where they may. Now, the other problem is let's say you do get long something and let's say you try to stop up and let's say you get stopped out to the penny. Okay. Well, you could use a little discretion here if you are disciplined. Okay. If you're not disciplined, just let the stop get hit. And then maybe someday you'll have discipline. And then if you don't, that's okay too. As long as you have the discipline to have the stop in place, let it get taken out. Longer term, you'll probably do just fine. Okay. But a little discretion can help you trading. So what you could do, and I don't want to turn this into a lecture on discretion. We've got plenty of those out there because, like, as I said, I don't want to beat the dead horse because I often do, at least as my wife says. Um, but let's say you do have a stop in place. You could set an alarm. Let's say set an alarm about right here, okay, and go about your life. So if this alarm triggers on your smartphone or whatever, you know that you might have to take some action if you were going to exercise the discretion, okay? Now, you can't be the proverbial deer in the headlights and freak out if it goes through that stop and keeps on going, okay? That's the problem with trading. It's really unfair. You let a few trades get away from you, or you're screwed, okay? So you're going to have to get out. You're going to have to have that uncle point in mind if it does kind of nick that stop and keep on going, okay? In some cases, you're better off just having that stop in place. Now, as I've said before, let's say you're in longer-term trend-following mode and your stop is pretty far away. Well, you could leave a mechanical stop in place, okay? If you get taken out, then you want to be out of the position anyway. As I said last week in the week of charts and also in my column, if you look at my website, where would you be wrong, dead wrong in a trade? Once you let that stop widen out, you have to start asking yourself. And if you look at the call, it's got a little old lady looking at her laptop like, holy moly, if I get stopped out, I'm going to get creamed in this trade. I'm going to give up a lot of open profits. So you could do a few little discretionary things to hang in there. If the stop's a long ways away, then just forget about it. Don't even try to micromanage it or use discretion. And, and your life will probably get a lot easier. Uh, the entry problem can be a little tough. There are rare cases where front running, meaning that getting in just before the entry is a thing to do. If market conditions are really, 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 really good and sector conditions are really, really good, especially if, let's say, the market has a big opening gap reversal, just gets like wiped out on the open and all of a sudden starts coming back like crazy, like a banshee, then by all means, you can go in and front run that setup. And again, this is this is a little bit more advanced. This is provided you have the general discipline to follow your plan to begin with. That's okay. Now, most people, I've got one or two guys that say, oh, I'm, I'm worried about too many people in the service or whatever. Well, so far that hasn't been a problem. Because if you look at the time in sales, when the, when the trigger gets actually hit, usually there's crickets. Every now and then there's some movement, okay? And every now and then there's some pretty serious skittage. 
But I don't think that has anything to do with my people because more often than not, you'll see a few odd lots go by and then you'll see the, the stock just kind of meander right around an entry. Okay. So what's happening is these people either aren't taking the, aren't taking the trades to begin with, as uh, Greg Morris, stealing a from Greg Morris, they sharpshoot the signals. They're sharpshooting the signals. Or they're getting in early to begin with, okay, or trying to outsmart the system, and they're not following the plan. So provided you discipline enough, then you could certainly – front run if conditions are conducive but more often than not conditions are conducive okay more often than not everything is not set up for a front run okay so yeah one of the things you find very hard is make a decision with stocks just a few cents away from the entry of the, of the trigger or the stop yeah absolutely okay I, I, that's tough okay I, I never I hope I don't make trading sound easier than it is. Now, when, when I'm in a printing money phase, I'll probably be a little bit more egotistical and make it sound like it's a lot easier than it is. Trading is not easy, but it's not nearly as difficult difficult as many try to make it. Okay, Maybe that's another write that down type of thing. It's not nearly as difficult as many try to make it. As I've written about before, I've helped a couple of people win stock picking contests. And how do I do that? Well, I give them a few simple rules. Now, in, in both cases, the market's cooperated, which obviously helps quite a bit. In longer term, you know, we don't know if we could, they'll, they'll still be uh, winning contests or winning 10 years from now. But at the least, it proves that trading can be taught and trading can be, you could be successful at least over a short period of time, at least over a short period of time. And the reason is because you're just following a plan. There's no emotions involved. You're a kid. You want to get out of your class. You could give a flip about trading stocks. Okay, Dave, what do I do? I just do this, do this, do this, do this. All right, I'm going to do that. <laughs> hey, I made a day. See you. Thank you. Because it's easy to follow a plan when there's none of these psychological demons, okay, pissing you off. I'm losing money today. I'm pissed off, all right? So am I going to revenge trade? No, I'm not going to do that, okay? But, but boy, I feel like it. I, I, need, I feel like I need to make a few trades to make back this money I lost today, okay? I'm aggravated. But if I was just following the system and there was no money on the line, I could care less, that would be pretty easy. There'd be no emotions attached to it, okay? Any advice on bypassing the brokers and activity fees while paper trading? No. Uh, put a bunch of money in a brokerage account, I think, uh, and you shouldn't have any fees. Um, that should be negligible, those fees. Um, if, they, if they're not negligible, then you might need to find another broker. Uh, that shouldn't be – it shouldn't be – that much. I don't understand why you would, would have a tremendous amount of inactivity fees. I mean, maybe if you're trading with a broker that's a direct access or something or whatever, a high-end broker, I could see where that would happen. Or maybe you're trading with a broker where they pay for your data feed if you make so many trades. I hear you on that. But it's kind of like tax implications. Some people out there talk about tax implications. Well, taxes and trading, one has nothing to do with the other. Now, go to your financial planner, and, and, and if you have to make some, some – uh, don't say, well, Dave says don't worry about that. Yeah, of course, you got to worry about it. But if you're trading, you can't let things like taxes influence your trades. You can't let things like your child's education influence your trades. You can't let things like you have to pay the rent influence your trade. Okay, You have to have that trading account set aside just for that so yeah um you know i'd hate to i hate to give you bad advice but i had a broker once that had some kind of uh stipulations like that and it pissed me off so i would fire off a day trade every now and then and that's that's kind of like bad behavior so so don't do that uh don't let that broker encourage you to do that just go ahead and eat that fee and if that fee becomes too much then then find another broker Okay. 
Would you recommend trading smaller with the same rules as a way to get reps? For example, risking 1% instead of 2 Absolutely. Now, here's the problem, okay? If you're going to do that, you need to be consistent. And if you look on YouTube, there's plenty of uh, – I've done plenty of videos on this. So let's say even risking like a quarter percent. I mean, so much – so little, it's almost meaningless. And that's a good way to get reps in. But don't do a quarter percent, quarter percent, quarter percent. Oh, I think I got this. Let's do 2%. Because what's going to happen? You're going to make a little, make a little, make a little, and then you're going to get whacked on this, and then you go back to a quarter percent, okay? And then you'll never be successful. What you need to do is a quarter percent, a quarter percent, a quarter percent, okay? Then jump to a half. Win, lose, a draw. Stay at a half. And stay at a half. Keep staying at a half, provided that you feel confident. Okay, first risk nothing. Okay, this is paper trading. Now keep in mind, as I say quite often, I've never been an unsuccessful paper trader. And of course, one guy comes up to me a few months after I wrote that, tells me he's not successful as a paper trader. I was like, well, how long have you been paper trading? Oh, three weeks. Okay, well, okay. I've never been a six. Come on, work with me. I've never been an unsuccessful paper trader who's who's paper traded long enough to understand the markets, to understand his methodology. Okay. And if you aren't unsuccessful as a paper trader, don't don't put real money in a line. But when you make this transition over here, obviously that's what the psychological demons rear their ugly head. But just make sure you're consistent throughout, okay? And I've tried in the past, tried uh, allocating more money to something that I felt like was going to work better than something that I did. And because sometimes I just know going into a position I'm going to make money. They don't make money. And my clients will be like, why do you tell me that you do going in? It's like, well, because sometimes everything lines up and everything looks perfect and it doesn't work. And sometimes there's a decent looking position. I don't feel like it's the best thing in the world, but I think it's worthy of a trade. And sometimes those could turn into a big trade. So don't stress yourself out by trying to sharpshoot the signals, as I just said a few minutes ago. Take the signals provided they're they're good, okay, provided you're being picky and selective, and just be consistent in your trades. And if you're successful after so many trades, you got those reps in, then go ahead and bump it up. So that 2%, you want to slowly work up to that 2% goal, okay? And 2% is plenty, believe me, okay? You can get in a lot of trouble even at 2%. But you don't want to go, you don't want to do this. Because as Murphy would have it, when you're on your big trades, you're going to lose. And you're on your little trades, you're going to make money. And you'll end up, what did I just say? You must position yourself for unlimited gains and limited losses. You end up with the old, as the old commodity adage says, eating like a bird and defecating like an elephant. Okay? I could see no picture. Is it me? It could be you. Uh, these are on YouTube about two hours after, two or three hours afterwards. Uh, so if you have any technical difficulties, sometimes as I often say, a squirrel will get his nuts caught in the wires between uh, me and you. He'll be moving his nuts, and then they'll get caught in the wires, and something will happen. But uh, the, the local recording is very robust. Dave, you concerned about the VIX being so low? We'll talk about that. There's always something to worry about. What do you do when a stock opens and gaps up and past your entry? Well, there's plenty of there's plenty of uh, uh, videos out there on that. Let me just give you the quick answer, okay? If it gaps above your entry, let's say your entry is right here. If the gap is pretty small, then a lot of times just just take the trade, okay? If the gap is kind of big and not like past the prior highs, okay? Let me redraw this better. I don't want to – I said I wasn't going to say the whole thing, and here I go. Okay. First of all, let's say your entry is right here. If the gap is right here, then just take it, okay? As a general rule, just take it, okay? If the gap is somewhere in here, let's say a gap's open to here, and then it immediately comes back in, avoid the trade, okay? If the gap is here, and then the stock begins to rally – then you have to make that go or no-go decision, okay? If it's way up here, then just let it go. Forget about it. 
okay? Because it's no longer a pullback if it's way up here. Just let it go. But again, somewhere in between, you have to make that go or no-go decision if it begins to rally up. So no-brainer, small gap, don't split hairs. Medium gap comes back in, no-brainer, leave it alone. This is where it becomes a little tougher. You have to make that go or no-go decision. Now, see the videos out there, and I think you'll, uh, you'll be great. Found it. Risk becomes too great, you pass. Found if, you, if your risk becomes too great, you pass. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you're saying, but you have to embrace the fact that you're you're going to, you're putting money in the harm's way, okay? And then you have to realize that on every trade, okay, it's almost like you have to see it as a cost. And that's my way of wrapping my head around it. One thing I've been thinking about lately is maybe your maybe your psychology is a little different than mine. Maybe your mileage may vary. But for me, I have to see every trade as a cost. How much does that trade cost? How much is it going to cost me? Is it going to cost me $2,000 on a $100,000 account? Do I really spend, feel like spending $2,000 on this trade? Yeah, because I might be able to make 10 or 20. So, yeah, I'll take it. Okay. If not, eh, I think I'll just pass. Keep my money. If your stop is too far away, pass. No, not necessarily. See, he's saying if your stop is too far away. Um, in an extreme case, let's say you have a, a stock with an HV of like 150 or something like that, then it's such an extreme case where your stop would have to be so far away that you would pass. But keep in mind that your position size is adjusted according to the stop. We have a position in the portfolio now. When we opened it up, there was a 34% stop. But, Dave, that's crazy. Well, that's what the position called for, okay, because it moved 30 40% over a few days, and it required a stop at least that wide. When you look at the chart, it squints your eyes, okay? The entry is here. Stop is here. It doesn't, it doesn't look like it's that far away, okay? It's, yeah, that's not too far away. But it's 34% because that's what this should call for. And luckily, knock on wood, so far we made 34% on the first loaf. And then I don't have the portfolio in front of me. I know it was dropping earlier. But it was up 50%, 60% or more so far on the rest. So you can't say I'm not going to take a trade because the stop is too far unless the volatility is, is out of whack because you're going to trade – Fewer and fewer shares. Let's say you had a, let's have a 34, 17. Is my math right on that? Let's say you had a 17% stop. Well, let's say at 34, let's say you're trading 400 shares, 400%. If it was a 17% stop, you would trade 200 shares. Okay. Now, I don't want to turn this into a money position management lesson. So, what I would recommend you do is just ask me for my spreadsheet, and I'll give you the spreadsheet with the open portfolio and those formulas are already in there. So you put in your account size, put in the trade size you want to do, and it'll calculate the number of shares for you. Okay. Uh, David says, when you're screening stocks, do you use the ADX to measure the strength of the trend or do you just eyeball it? I just eyeball it. Okay. And my first book, I think I put too much emphasis on ADX uh, back then, I was strongly encouraged to quantify everything for everyone. Uh, I was basic, Basically, I was told I would not be taken seriously in the trading world if I didn't quantify things. And I inadvertently put too much emphasis on ADX. I don't even use ADX anymore. I think when I switched over to using mostly telecharts for my charts, back then, telechart didn't have ADX. So it did. So that was... Uh, that helped me resist the urge to use that. Anything like ADX is going to have a tremendous amount of lag to it. So price in and of itself is the way to go. And then other than the occasional moving average, I don't use any other indicators. But a moving average can be quite powerful too. But for the most part, for the most part, uh, price in and of itself, at first and foremost. 
I asked the trader, what do you think of a strategy one-to-one -one ratio? He said it can't work. What do you say that it's trend following dependent on catching the big winner? Yeah, trend following is – yes. If all you made was one for one, eventually you would get a much bigger loss and lose. I did two videos completely on the potential of negative expectancy. So those videos are out there on YouTube. You might have to dig for them. Um, I have been working to uh, – what word am I looking for? Organize those a little bit better. But, yeah, if you can't find them, let me know. The secret is in the second loaf, okay? Again, what did I say a few minutes ago? Okay, you must allow for our limited losses and unlimited gains. So one for one will not work. But people say, oh, well, what if, what if I did one for three? Well, one for three is not going to work either. Wait, you're making three times as much as you lose. Yeah, but you're going to be three times more likely to get stopped out than you are to make that three-point gain, okay, or three times gain. Plenty of videos out there on that, so I don't want to uh, get too much into that. All right, let's um, let's hop into the charts. Okay, we getting a question on the low VIX, so let's let's address that first. The VIX, uh, the VIX has a the VIX tends to normalize at a level. To some extent, you could say, well, it's 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 low on an absolute basis, and I hear you because a VIX around. 11 on an absolute basis is pretty low. To those of you who don't know what VIX is, VIX is a hypothetical 30-day volatility, implied volatility, of calls and puts. Okay? And I think it's at the money calls and puts, if, uh, if memory serves. I don't want to show my ignorance and show you what little I know about it, but I, I used to – I programmed some VIX systems in my life. I no longer follow it very much. Uh, VIX is a thing that only matters when it matters. When you see a spike, I see I have a little spike drawn in here or uh, X'd out. When you see a spike like this, it's you know the market's probably going to bounce from that oversold condition, likely. Anything that really stands out like this. It's kind of a reversion to the mean market. So you got to figure out what that mean is or what that average is, okay? And then, and then kind of work around that. Now, that's a 200-day moving average. I don't know if you want to go that extreme. But the systems that I wrote were using like a 10-day moving average. You can see that the 200-day moving average is around 15 for the VIX. So it is fairly low. Let's take a look at a short-term average and see what it would be. Let's make this 200-day a 20-day a, a simple. Oops. It's, where's the where's my thing coming up? If I can do it, not too many screens are up. Oh, here we go. So let's make this a 20-day simple. And let's see where we are. Okay, you can see we're really not stretched at all based on this 20-day moving average. 10-day, 20-day moving average. Okay, and let's take a look at a 10-day because I think that's what my systems were built on years ago. I still get emails from people following the systems, which is kind of cool. So this is a 10-day moving average, or will be. So what I've found is when you get stretched away from the 10-day moving average, usually the market has a reversal. Um, I don't trade off these systems anymore because I found that short-term systems, you just simply don't make enough. But it is a tool to have in your toolbox or an arrow in your quiver. I'm never sure which analogy to use. But right now, we're really not stretched that far away from the moving average, so I wouldn't get too excited about it. And the other thing, too, is let's take a look at spiders first. 
the market really hasn't made a whole lot of forward progress in quite a while. So that might be reflecting that, okay? 1% move in eh, a little bit over a month. And then if you take today's move out, it's what? Uh, pretty much, eh, it's, yeah, it's a lot flatter, okay? So I wouldn't get too excited about that low VIX, but there's always something to worry about. But as long as we're at our near new highs as we are here in the P's, I wouldn't get too excited about that. Uh, as I said last week, we had a volatility fake out. Notice that volatility got low, market sold off hard, and when it comes back above this high, it's actually a buy, okay? It's so far so good on that. But again, that's a short-term system. Let's not get too caught up in short-term systems. But yes, so far it's worked nicely, but I wouldn't I wouldn't count on that system anymore because it's already it's already has made its pop higher. Let's take a look at the actual P's, the cash. In other words, cash is a little bit cleaner than the um, spiders. You can see we did have the little volatility fake out. And so far, so good. We're up here at all-time highs. You guys know me. I'd like to see this market just accelerate higher and not look back for a while before having any correcting action. But it is kind of interesting. The market is a little bit of a sell-off like yesterday. The whole world is like chicken little. Oh, no. Oh, it's like the sky is falling. Yeah. It was down, what, a quarter percent? It's no big deal. Okay. But, yeah, I'd feel a lot better if we just break out and not look back for a while. The problem is, as I've been saying quite a bit, if we do come back in, number one, we're back into the short-term range. And then number two, if we come below that too much, we're back into this longer-term soup. Okay. So, but so far, so good. As a trend follower, you can't argue with new highs. And you just have to put your ego aside. I know I had some big sell signals last summer, and I was really worried about the market. But, hey, it's a trend follower. You have to say, well, that didn't work. Let's just move on here. Let's take a look at NASDAQ. NASDAQ's hanging in there, too. Again, though, I sure would like it to, or another analogy, I mean, the fact that it's, really did not pass his prior high and he was somewhat concerning. So I'd like to see it bust past his prior high here, not look back for a while. The other thing to worry about, or like I said, is always something to worry about. Notice that we kind of took off it here and then we sort of lost steam, but that's still a pretty good run though. Okay. From 5,000 to 5,200, that's still a decent run. Better than poking the eye, right? But again, I'd like to see it clear this prior high in here before getting too, too excited because you know, there's that net net problem kind of on an extreme basis, but that's what one year of flat trading uh, on a net net basis. OK. Short term, intermediate term, not too shabby, but I sure would like to like us to get past this prior high. The other thing, while we're worried about everything in here, right, one other concern I have is sometimes it's hard for a market to mount a new leg on top of an old one. But we're not going to question it too much. OK, we have stops in place just in case. Hey, that's a good that's a good little saying. Have a stop in place just in case. The uh, Jesse Jackson School of uh, Trading, right? Or is that uh, what's the other guy? Who was the OJ guy? Have a stop in place just in case. Uh, IWM or the Rusty? Not a bad day there. Almost a do-over from yesterday. Let's not focus too much on the micro, but certainly okay. Uh, Kind of like the S&P, a little bit like the S&P. We do have a little bit of a sideways range in here. We don't want to see it pull back into this range. And then as I've been complaining about ad nauseum, um, still has quite a bit of overhead supply to deal with. So let's take a look at bonds. Bonds are pretty amazing uh, as far as where they are longer term. Somebody was saying something in, in the uh, webinar. I hosted a webinar on Monday, as I often do, or, or sometimes do, I should say. And somebody said, uh, with rates like at 1% or whatever, it's like, let me get this right. Uh, you give me a million dollars, and all I have to do is give you $1,000 back or whatever it is. Or is that 10000 I forget. 10000 Okay. Well, obviously, you'd like to see that principle back, but it's kind of a scary thing if, if, the, if that begins to implode a little bit and that capital is a return, then it could get pretty ugly. So it is a pretty risky venture to chase those low rates. But not a whole lot to report in bonds. If you look at them shorter term, they're just kind of hovering in here. But longer term, they are kind of at nosebleed levels. And how low can interest rates go? I don't know. Would it, would it England cut their rates from like 0.25 to zero? <laughs> Whatever. 
most sectors looking pretty good in here. A few sectors like insurance, not quite the brand new highs, but a lot of the technology areas like the semiconductors, as you can see, it doing pretty darn good in here at or near new highs. So, so far so good. On pullbacks, we should start seeing quite a few setups in here. I've been fairly bullish on the metals and mining stocks uh, for quite a while, and they're doing okay. Uh, when you look at them like this, it looks like a huge longer-term trend. When you back the chart way out, you'll see that this is the mother of all bottoms we had earlier this year. Uh, you can see this was from a webinar I was in yesterday. I was on a panel, and we were talking about uh, – I got asked about bow ties, and I was pointing out we did have a bow tie in the metals way back here. And – Longer term, from a cyclical standpoint, looks like they bottomed out. Looks like they're on their way back higher. Energies, I thought we had a bottom in energies, but now it's, it's back to becoming more of a process than an event. So I would avoid energies for now. If you're long any, as you might be, then uh, honor your stops just in case. Don't micromanage. Don't say, oh, it's dead money. Let things unfold. Now, if you within the energies, if you take a look at oil, Oil has become a bit of a disappointment. You can see that we did have that mother of all bottoms. Let's put the bow ties in for S&Gs and back the chart out a little bit. Okay. Uh, if you're, this is your first webinar, by the way, I do have a special report just on bow ties. And I did fix my reports, and my apologies for that. Uh, I've been dealing with some software issues lately. And uh, I think I've got everything pretty much ironed out. So the, all the reports are back up and running. But we did have a bow tie here, and it looked like that was the mother of all bottoms. But now it looks like we're kind of rolling back over. So we might come down and make another bottom in here. Could be a, a double bottom or something, okay? But looking okay uh, longer term, but I wouldn't buy it at this juncture. I wouldn't rush out and short because, yeah, it looks like it's headed back to its old lows, but I don't think that's worth a short. If you're going to short a market, short it as a general statement when it's at much higher levels. OK, now, if we get into a rip roaring bear market where everything's going down, all stocks are going down, all sectors are going down, then you there's nothing to be left at high levels. OK, but as a general statement, you want to short stocks as they're coming off of high levels. I think AHS was a, a good this was in my uh, trading service Landry list. I didn't say short it, but it was in one of my watch lists. You can see big thrust down. Now it's a bow tie, a little bit of a pullback in here. So you want to short something that looks like that as opposed to try to short something that's down towards its old lows, okay? Uh, without beating a dead horse too much, you could just kind of uh, tool through the sectors. You can see most sectors are looking pretty good in here. Um, again, there's always something to worry about. Transport's wide and loose sideways longer term. But enough other areas are doing good enough for me not to worry too much. Gold and silver still looks pretty good. Been a choppy ride there, always is. Tough to get on, those stocks sometimes, but uh, so far so good. In those stocks okay okay um let's take a look at the dollar itself and then we'll take a we'll, let's go ahead and open it up for uh, individual stocks um as i think i said a while back we had a weekly bow tie in the dollar so as a general statement the dollar is headed lower but you can see it's mostly sideways in here so i wouldn't get too excited one way or the other the top is probably still in place but i wouldn't rush out and trade it but if this dollar does continue lower from this big picture top if that's what that is then a dollar being worth less will drive up commodity prices commodities are dollar denominated if you didn't know that write that down so a little intermarket technical analysis rear its ugly head so if the dollar begins to drop it's going to take more dollars to buy commodities, so those commodities will be headed higher. Into market technical analysis, as John Murphy says, who actually wrote the book on it, has long lead and lag time. So it's good to know, but hard to time off of. And that's that's a, you got to be careful with with any technical analysis that's good to know, but hard to time off of. As a general statement, if you can't time off of it, toss it out. One exception I will make is intermarket technical analysis because sometimes it works really well, but sometimes it don't due to long lead and lag time. So I think it's worth knowing and only worry about it when it actually 
works. As I said quite a few times, I was in a forum a while back. I've tried throughout my career to pop into forums, and then it's just usually it's just a, a abysmal because it's a bunch of a-holes just trying to show each other how much they know, and um, they they just they just they're just crazy. They, the people say things that they wouldn't say to somebody's face. I'm six foot two, two seventy, built like a linebacker. I'm sure they wouldn't say some of these things to my face. Not that I'm a big tough guy. I'm a big softy, but I'm kind of intimidated, you know. <laughs> but uh, people get behind their computers. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is somebody in there. I, I said, hey, you want to trade bow ties on the S and P's? If that's what you're looking for a system, just try bow ties. And one guy chimed in with, oh, all you have to do, if the dollar's up, you sell S&Ps. If the dollar's down, then you buy them. And what he was seeing was a very small part of the market where that intermarket technical analysis had had clicked. And what he didn't realize, and I'm sure he realized by now because he's probably out of business, is that it doesn't always work. Okay? I don't want to digress too far. Too late? Do you have a maximum number of stocks per sector in your portfolio? Ideally... Ideally, no more than two per sector. Sometimes I push the envelope on that a little bit in more recent times because we've only had like uh, earlier this year, mostly uh, metals and mining and all. I tend to push the envelope a little bit on that. Now, one thing to remember, and I've said this quite a bit before, but I'll say it again to those of you who are newer to um, my presentations. Um, if you look at the portfolio... There's two slots for each position. So it's half the shares are here and half the shares are here. So let's just pull a number out the air, 400, okay? So there's 200 shares here and 200 shares here. All 400 shares are bought at one time. Let's say this is a gold stock, okay? And then let's say we see another gold stock, and let's just assume that's the same, a similar volatility, and we got 200 shares here and 200 shares here, okay? Now... I'll allow for two full positions. So this is one position, one full position, and this is one full position here. Now let's say that we take partial profits on this stock. We're blessed with that. So now we have one half position open. And then let's say that we take partial profits on this one. So now we have one half position open here. So what's one half plus one half? That equals one. So now we have one slot open for another gold stock should one set up okay so two full positions but if the market's trending nicely you could end up with i guess up to four positions in the same sectors it would be four half positions two full positions okay all right let's uh let's jump to the charts start looking at some stocks Okay, VIVE, VIVE, persisted pullback, not enough. Must have a bad tick in here. Let's uh, zoom in a little bit. Yeah, that's a problem. Sometimes you get a bad tick of these. Okay, I got you. Uh, yeah, really kind of thin on the volume. Uh, let's take a look at, I spent probably, oh, I don't know, not an hour, but I spent, Quite a bit of time in the IPO course talking about volume, but this is this stock's been out for a while, so I would be a little bit more concerned about the volume than if it was just kind of coming out, okay? Like like that pie that we're long. Uh, the pie volume has really dried up, and that's why somebody told me yesterday, oh, they're gonna they're gonna bail out two days ago, they're gonna bail out on a trade. Well, so far it's worked its way higher. In fact, it's actually a buy if it uh, stays up these levels. It stays above 20. It's actually a buy today uh, or whatever this number is here. What's this number? 1973. Anything above 19, any close above 1973, it's still a buy. But you'll notice that the volume's pretty low in here, okay? Well, Dave, I thought you wouldn't trade something so low. Well, as a general statement, I don't, but you had 5 million shares. Is my math right on that? Yeah, you had 5 million shares on the opening day. And you had like uh, three quarters of a million, 400,000, uh, 250,000 round numbers. So 400,000, 500,000. So as a general statement, you got pretty good volume so far. Very tough to judge the volume on an IPO. But as long as you've got a few big volume days, it's probably okay to trade them. 
as a private trader. Now, I do get emails from RIA saying, hey, Dave, congratulations on the IPO. Obviously, I couldn't take it from me and my clients. That's a different, that's a different story. But as a private trader, you can take these trades, okay? Now, getting back to VIVE, yeah, you, Donald, I think you answered your own question. I think it's a little too thin um, volume-wise. It's barely 40,000, 50,000 shares. And so far today, it's only, what, uh, 18,000 shares? It's not much, okay? Um, fairly persistent move so far, but it's going to take quite a bit of a knockout to uh, for me Provided that the volume was heavier, uh, the charts messed up, so it's hard to look at this. Uh, you might want to confirm that this is actually an IPO. Um, type that into like uh, stockcharts.com or something and see if you get a longer term chart. But yeah, the volume is too low on that. But I hear you as far as the pattern is concerned. So good eye on that. CHK for RJ. That's going to be check something, huh? Chesapeake. Uh, no. See, this is this is the – remember earlier I said the net-net problem? Talked about that. Where is it now? Where was it? Okay, so it's gone really – I mean, it depends on what day you pick, obviously, but it really hasn't gone anywhere in quite a while based on the volatility of the stock. Okay, well, yeah, it's 20%, but, you know, squint your eyes. I'm sure you could find one bar in here where it's pretty much where it was back there, certainly right around its high. So, no, there's, there's nothing to do here. Nothing to see here, nothing to do. Francesco says, two weeks ago, we talked about American Waterworks, AWK. Seemed good to all of us as a buy. 83, now it's five points lower. All right, AWK. Well, I didn't like it because of the lower volatility in here. And this is kind of a case in point. This, this move from here to here, that's a pretty serious move. OK. And then the other reason and, and I don't want to I, I'll have to rewind the tape, go back and look at it. But one concern I think I might have had, if memory serves, with this one was the. Um, that bonds are so high, it's kind of dangerous to buy anything that's. Interest rate sensitive. OK. So, yeah, it looked OK. But two things. Number one. Sometimes the greatest setup in the world doesn't work. And number two, based on the volatility of this, I said it would probably be worthwhile to pass. Number three, even if something is low in volatility, something bad can still happen. So this is a, well, that's only 5%. It's a 5% drop, but let's just see what this move is uh, from here to here. That's 5%. Okay, well, 5%. That's still not that big of a deal. But yeah, sometimes it just doesn't. Sometimes it just doesn't work. But there are a lot of caveats you could you could add in, such as the fact that the HV was really low in this particular case. Now, I won't always factor in bonds into my to, to the equation. If this was the mother of all setups, then I wouldn't worry about so much about bonds. But if I have a reason to pick something to go part, then I tend to throw in other reasons, and hopefully that makes some sense. Okay. COTV on a pullback? Maybe. This has been one of those uh, crazy IPOs that has uh, taken off. I've got some of my um, people who bought the IPO course who are along this. Uh, so congratulations to you. Uh, possibly. The only problem is it's getting a little crazy in here. Uh, let's just check this move out. Let's see what it's done over the last couple of days. 25% in two days. That's going to be hard to sustain. Um, I'll know it when I see it. Let's just see how it shakes out. Okay, ACIA might be another one. That that was one that we got shaken out of. Uh, that could be worthwhile. A little bit less crazy. Okay, and this is one we got shaken out of back here, unfortunately. Although I know some people are still long, and congratulations. Sometimes you get lucky. Uh, dollar bow tied from highs. Did we talk about that? DLR. Yeah, that's one of those REITs. Um, you know, getting back to that interest rate argument. If you are going to short something, short something at high levels if it's interest rate related because the it's there's a good chance that rates have, have ran their course, okay? But I wouldn't make a trade off that in and of itself. 
Uh, yeah, it's bow tie down, but keep in mind that the bow ties could have a little lag to it. Now, in some cases, like the aforementioned energy stocks and the gold stocks and all those other ones, uh, kind of bottomed out, bow tied all around the same time. But sometimes you get a, a more sharper rollover like this, and then the bow tie takes a while to catch up. So you see this little X in here, that was your first thrust on that. I did not go after this, but I'm not a big fan of trading the REITs. But yes, I hear you on that one. Okay, good uh, good eye. Hey, Dave, when an IPO breakout, an IPO breakout, for example, when is an IPO breakout an breakout FPR? Uh, for Susie, let's see. Uh, TWLO. Well, as part of the rules, in, and as I outlined in the IPO course, watch the watch the um, the intro video. I don't know how much I got into the breakout characteristics, uh, but in the intro video, I talked about anything above twenty dollars a share, or at least in the course that, that you have to be a little bit more careful if you're playing the breakouts. As a general rule, for those of you who are like, Dave, I thought you were a pullback player. I am, but there are some characteristics, some specific characteristics in IPOs where you do play the breakout, okay? Um, in more recent times, because the stock market is doing well, maybe, and it's like the sentiment right now is, is IPOs are still pretty hot as a general statement. The good thing is they're hot and they're not. The, the, there's a big demarcation between the good ones and the bad ones. The bad ones are coming public and just imploding. What do I call that? I call that the die and a die. And then you have the other ones, which are creating the fly pattern, which is kind of cool, meaning they're going high, they're flying higher. Um, but, yeah, I wouldn't rush out and trade this one. But if it continues higher on a pullback, absolutely. You got nice volume on this. Still some excitement about it because it's an IPO. Absolutely. Okay, light spinoff year ago earnings today, similar to ACIA, which has earnings after the close today, hot area. Light, that's one we used to look at a little bit. Seem to remember that one. Yeah, it's not really set up uh, at this moment, but I hear you. This is uh, what I would call a toddler when it comes to IPOs. Toddler being being um, relatively new IPO within the last few years. Okay with the last couple of years, year or two, there's still some excitement about this stock out there. So maybe on a pullback, uh, maybe it's a little wide and loose, but maybe if it TKOs on the earnings, remember what CLX, CLDX, I think was, did a while back, maybe that's probably two years ago. I'm getting old fast. <laughs> Life comes at you fast. Remember that commercial? Um, but you had some sort of news event, you had a big knockout move. So maybe if you have a big knockout move, Tonight, then tomorrow might be worth a shot. So put that one on your list for sure. Good eye, uh, Howard. Oh, two days ago. Okay. Earnings two days. Oh, earnings were two days ago. Okay. So um, so that makes no sense. Don wants to know about JCP. JCP I probably won't like. Too big, too thick, and probably, uh, yeah, see, what did I say earlier? Draw your line. I mean, it's going sideways for too long. If you wanted to, yeah, it looks like longer term. Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe it's the mother of all long-term bottoms or bases, but it's hard for me to get excited about that. Short-term sideways, intermediate-term sideways, long-term sideways. I didn't buy it. Good, okay. Francesco did not buy the AWK. Five and uh, Again, another toddler in here, looking kind of interesting. Um, I do like these toddlers when they make these bow ties or these IPOs come down and make bow ties. I probably should uh, add that into my IPO course. Whenever I redo it, I'll add. I'll probably add in that. Uh, if you do have IPOs that die out, when they do eventually bottom out, they get their act together. In this case, you had a bow tie here. You had another bow tie here. And then you want to look at it now. My only problem about now is that we really didn't clear this past peak, this prior peak in here too much. So for me to get excited about it, I like to see it decisively clear this prior peak. Stop me if you heard that before, kind of like the NASDAQ right now. Now look back for a while and then maybe have a TKO or a pullback type of move in here. To those of you who don't know what TKO is, 
Uh, TKO is just simply when you have a stock in a persistent, ideally accelerating trend, you should be able to draw a big arrow in the chart, okay? And then you have a knockout move. It looks something like this. And this shakes out the nervous longs. It might even shake out some longer-term players, and it also attracts in some eager, eager shorts, okay? All right, I got to keep on keeping on here. Uh, Donald wants to talk about Z. We've got, we got so many Donalds in here. It's interesting. Uh, Z has a little gap down in it. That's the first thing kind of catches my eye. So I think I would avoid it based on that. Um, there's a problem. When a stock gaps against the trend, is a problem. Notice the moving averages are coming together. So this could be a shorting opportunity. I don't want to rush out and short stocks just yet. It is a relatively new issue, so it could be a little bit dangerous to short. Might be hard to borrow. You have to check. Volume's pretty good. Uh, depending on what the overall market does, I might start taking a short or two. Every now and then, I'll take one just for SGs to make sure I don't forget how to do it. Uh, but yeah, long or short, I would wait for a possible short on this. But for now, I would hold off on shorts in general. Okay. LOL, you're such a curmudgeon, Dave. Has anyone mentioned a stock you like yet? Give us one you like. Uh, PI. I like PI. Well, here's the thing. What are my setups coming into today? What did I say? What did I say you should trade today? Nothing. Okay, I have zero setups coming in today, so I'm not I'm not an old fart and pissed off. It's just that it's the methodology requires a pullback. Okay, so let's take a look at the S&P 500. So it really has it pulled back in here. We're hovering around new highs. We're at new highs now, so there's really not a whole lot of stocks that are set up. Now, there are times when people in service are like, Dave, knock it off. I can't keep up. Have you ever met a setup you don't like? Okay. There are times when I'm like that. Right now, at this particular moment in time, is not one of those times. And you know what? As I preach, and as I said earlier, I wish somebody would have told me 20-something years ago, you don't have to trade every day like the little rat gone out the cocaine. Uh, this one's a little bit crazy in here, but it could it could work, okay? Uh, a little bit more deeper pullback. Hey, I didn't say I didn't like everything. I just said that I just threw some caveats out, okay? Wait for a deeper pullback. Wait for some acceleration. Uh, except for, like, JCP and things like that going straight sideways. But, yeah. You know, this one looks kind of interesting. I like the gap higher. Gap here, gap here. Let's get this act together. I wouldn't worry about this trading too much back here, okay? Uh, sometimes they die and then they fly, okay? What did I say earlier? Sometimes they bottom out, begin to take off. So, a little bit more pullback in here. Maybe it pulls back, eh, let's say, uh, 39 and a half or something. It might be worth a shot. So I, it's not like I don't like it. I'm just waiting for a, a few more things. Go, go. Go, go, bow tie from low. Go, go. Uh, well, this is what I call a forced bow tie because it made this big pop higher. Uh, bow tie is really more for like a gradual type of uh, thing. This one does have a lot of overhead supply to deal with. Now you got me thinking. Now you kind of jinx me. It's like I don't want to. I don't want to be like Mikey and hate everything. But yeah, I probably would pass based on the amount of overhead supply on that one. I wouldn't call that a bow tie, but don't get too caught up in semantics. Uh, it's a first thrust, if it's anything. Okay, XBI, something I like. PI, I think PI has potential still. Talking my position, but I still think it has poten potential. Anything. Any close uh, above, let's say, 1975, it's still a buy. Okay. Five, and we talked about. Donald says, help me out with pie. I don't see the setup. That's because it's something from the course. Okay. <laughs> I can't give that away. You watch the video on the side. Usually, you, I usually give away everything, but that particular case, it's in the, uh, it's in the course which was just on sale. It'll be on sale someday. Uh, semiconductor stock, foreign stock. Uh, I wouldn't get too excited about the gaps. It is a foreign stock. Maybe on a pullback, longer term it has some issues. I think in the semis, I would look for some semis that are out in clear air. And the reason I'm a little concerned about overhead supply is anybody who bought during this range might be looking to get out of break even. Uh, shorter term, it's certainly not bad looking though. A little bit more pullback, it could be worthwhile. But 
that overhead supply concerns me. So within the semis, I would find something that was a little clearer. XBI for Mr. David. That's what my wife calls me when she's mad at me. David. Um, this is Biotech. Biotech's been doing pretty good lately. Usually I prefer buying individual stocks. Uh, this I would prefer if this low was much, much lower down here as opposed to fairly mid-levels. Uh, but yeah, bullish or bearish, I would be bullish in the biotechs. They worked their way higher. They pulled back. You had a cup and handle. Okay. I don't think I'd rush out and buy the XBI, but biotech certainly improving. Maybe some individual stocks there might be worth a go. Uh, do I treat foreign stocks such as AUO differently? Not necessarily. I, the gaps, I don't worry about the gaps as much. If it's a gap against a trend, because the gap is just reflective mostly reflective of the overnight trading. If it's a huge gap, then by all means, uh, worry about it. But as a general statement, I don't worry about it too much. Dave, what do you think about Home, new IPO for Susie? Oh, said your name right. Um, yeah, I mean, let's let's see how many days. What One week's worth of trading? One, two, three, four, five. Um, there's a, a couple of caveats within the... Um, within the breakout rule here. So it would actually have to close above uh, whatever the high of this bar is for me to get interested. But absolutely, it's uh, it's worth being on your radar. The only thing I don't like is it's, uh, it says electronic stores. So before going after a pioneer type of setup, meaning that first little breakout that we talked about in the course, I would look at it very carefully and say, well, wait a minute, how exciting is an electronic store? Not that I would not trade, not that I would not, not that I wouldn't trade electronic store, but an IPO in general, I want a little bit of excitement. I want something to give it some, some you know, what's the story fad of glory, as I said, the course. So I would be a little bit less inclined to take that first pioneer type of setup and a little bit more inclined to see if it could follow through longer term. But yes, it would be a buy above the high uh, there, technically, according to uh, one of the patterns. AMRN for Andre. Andre, you're quiet today. Hope you're feeling okay. Uh, a little bit of a gap down that has me concerned here. Let's back to chart way out, see what's happening. Uh, I think we talked about this before. Big gap down here, a little concerning. Shorter term, though, I hear you. It looks okay. I think I'd pass based on this gap here on that one. Yeah, I guess I am like Mikey today. I hate everything. But not for long, okay? If the market thinks they hang, hang in there, not for long. One of my problems here, okay, what did I just say? What's the story? Uh, fad or glory? Maybe they have some foods that could be a fad. I mean, I was like a burrito company a while back. It was pretty good. You know, it was fad, but it was good. Um and notice that the range, 23, 25, 25, 25, that's not enough range for me to get too excited about an IPO, okay? Something should, should like, take a look at that pie. Notice that it went from way down here to way up here. That's a pretty good range percentage-wise as opposed to uh, whatever this is percentage-wise. That's a 10% move at, at best. Okay, investor at home, com, not electronic storm. Okay, yeah, is that one of those uh, electronics for like uh, uh, security or something? So yeah, that's it's all the it's always more difficult than it uh, than it seems, right? Sometimes in a case like that, you want to you want to look at the actual company and find out what they do. Not that you're looking at the fundamentals or anything, but you want to see if you're trading an IPO pioneer pattern. Okay. By pioneer pattern, it's like the IPO just comes out. The IPO just comes out it's somewhere in here. You need to think about, well, what's the excitement? Okay. No, for sure. Yeah. Also not sexy. Yeah. Ideally, you want it to be, you kind of want it to be sexy if you take it that pioneer pattern. Now, if, if the thing, if the thing takes off and looks like this and pulls back, then close your eyes and buy, you know, when it triggers that, that pullback. But if it's a pioneer setup, meaning that you're trying to get in really, really early, then it's okay to wait for that secondary pattern. If it's a mother of all IPOs, then there'll be time to get long along along the way if it's not a great, uh, exciting stock. FSM. All right. One time for one or two more, and we'll have to wrap things up. 
No, I'm going to pass on FSM because the net net move, we really didn't clear this prior high in here. Uh, let's take a look at silver itself because that's a silver company. Yeah, silver itself is kind of sideways too. So wait for the next breakout there and then look to trade pullbacks along the way. Last one for Howard, APFH. Yeah, we talked about that one. Okay. All right, looks like uh, we're out of time. I appreciate you guys and girls showing up. I have a blast doing these shows, as you can tell. Any, any unanswered questions, you try to say David, Dave, Landry .com. Uh If we don't talk again between now and then, everyone have a fantastic weekend. And hope to see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much. I'm humbled that you guys and girls showed up today. Thank you so much.